Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. If you're watching online, good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. What an awesome, awesome day. The sun is shining. The sun is risen. It's, it's all working out today. This is beautiful. Let's go to God in prayer before we sing his praises today. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, as we come together in your presence, in your house, after a tough week, after a week of following Jesus down this path, after a Friday of seeing Jesus on that cross, suffering and dying for us because of our sin, and this morning, coming to that tomb, and seeing the stone rolled away and coming to that realization that you are not there, that you are risen. And we praise you, Lord, for what you have done for us, for completing this process, the greatest gift ever given. And so, Lord, this morning we want to tell you we love you. Thank you for what you've done. And while we praise you and celebrate you specifically today, we want this to be our prayer every day. Not just today, every day we wake up. The tomb is empty. Christ has risen. And one day we're going to be called home. We're going to see you again, Lord. Thank you. So we give you this time. Have your way. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Will you stand and sing with us?
Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. Morning. There we go. Happy Resurrection Day, everyone. I am so filled with joy. I'm, I'm back there. I had to do one of these because I had no tissues. So bear with me here this morning. A uh, couple announcements. My name is Sharon. I'm involved in the clothing pantry and the women's Bible study. Uh, we want to thank everyone who joined us for the Bible reading plan this week. It was the book of Mark. And if you'd like to continue to read together as a group, um, Join as we work through our way through the one-year Bible. It's free on the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, at 5 o'clock p.m., Cal Calvary Chapel Espanol will host a special service. Check your bulletin for the address, and it's a wonderful opportunity to gather and worship. Uh, next Saturday is a men's breakfast, 7.30 a.m. in the sanctuary. Uh, these guys have a lot of food, fellowship, and fun. I have to make the most important. Sorry, I'm going off script here. I hope they don't get the hook. He is risen. Let's try it again with the response. He is risen. Yay, thank you, God. Uh, next Saturday, the home group huddle will be from 3 to 5 at the loft. And whether you're hosting a home group or you're interested in learning more about getting involved in a home group, this is a t fantastic opportunity for you to meet people and learn about that. Join us at the Info Center, or you can go to ccleb.com. Um, last announcement always is the wonderful food pantry. If that would be a blessing to you or someone you know, you can uh, line up at, where do I get this? What room is it? 14 for the food bags for you or for somebody that needs it. And room 12 is somewhere where we can all go. And here's the goodies that we have today. Hot dogs, drinks, bananas, baked goods, whipped cream, and that gutsy is still over there. <laughs> they say it's really good and they say it gives you energy. So go try a gutsy. All right, guys, have a great and wonderful Easter day. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. He's risen. Anybody want bananas and hot dogs for Easter today? Hey, we're in John chapter 21 through 18 today. John chapter 21 through 18. Again, reminder, there are sermon notes available on our website. Should that be helpful for you as well? So... If anybody needs a Bible, raise a hand and our ushers will bring one to you from the back. Let's start with prayer. Father God, we are here today because Jesus is risen. We're here today because you sent your son into this world in a human body to live, to live out the gospel, to teach the gospel to go to the cross and pay for our sins, to rise from the dead. And we know now that Jesus sits with you, the right hand, at your right hand, the seat of power. And we're so thankful, God, for your love for us, that you loved us enough to send your son, Jesus, and that Jesus loved us enough to go to the cross for us. We thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that today you would connect your words to our minds and our hearts. You know all of our individual needs, Lord. Please minister to each of us exactly in places, Lord, that need to be touched by your truth today and by your love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could have looked into Jesus' empty tomb yourself, how would you have approached it? Would you have approached the empty tomb with fear or maybe confusion, maybe humility and wonder, maybe considering conspiracy theories, how would you have approached the empty tomb? Today we're gonna to look at three different disciples and how they approached the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus. We're gonna look through their eyes and see what they saw and observe what their body language suggests to us about their approach to the empty tomb. 
And yes, it is three eyewitnesses, and three, of course, is significant. In John chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, it says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They have taken away the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, John gives us a little bit of context here that's helpful and important for painting the backdrop of this passage. He tells us that it's early. This is a different word in the Greek than what was used in chapter 18, verse 28, where the word there in the Greek implies daybreak. The word here in John 20 implies that this is an hour or so before daybreak, so it's dark. And then John adds here for visual effect, he says, while it was still dark. And I wonder if that is as much a description of the ambient light in the moment as it is the disciples' grief and their outlook on life at this time. We know from the text that a grieving disciple of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, that she's up early before daylight and that she's at the tomb of her beloved rabbi, Jesus. The New Living Translation says this was Sunday morning. More traditional translations say on the first day. Now, this text is not from our Western European culture, so the phrase on the first day means the first day of the Jewish week, which technically starts at sundown at the end of Sabbath. Sundown ended Sabbath and began the Jewish New Week. Hence, this is the first day of the New Week. This definition of Jewish week holds true throughout the Old Testament. And that's evidence way back in the beginning by Genesis, the third verse of the book of Genesis, where we see the repeating refrain in Genesis 3, 3, 1, 3, and evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. The day starts with evening, then morning follows, so on. So that's what we see in our passage today, John 20, verse 1. The first day of the Jewish week began at sunset. There's two other countings of days that's happening here in the context as well. Passover, which is celebrated for a whole week, officially began at sunset, one Jewish day prior, making John 20, verse 1, the second day of Passover. The other counting that's happening in this context is that this is the third day since Jesus was crucified and buried. Jesus was crucified and buried on the day of preparation for Passover at exactly the time that the Passover lamb was sacrificed on the cross. So when it comes to understanding much of the Bible context, we in the West, we have to decrease our reliance on Western thinking and increase Jewish thinking and perspective. If you hold to a traditional Friday cru crucifixion, John 20 verse 1 is the first day of the Jewish week, it's the second day of Passover week, and it's the third day since Jesus' crucifixion and burial. In that phrase, third day, or in three days, that's a repeating pattern in the Old Testament. It occurs twice in John chapter 2, and as tantalizing as that is, we're not going to look at that today, but we will at some point. But you might be thinking to yourself right now, why is this level of detail necessary, including a date and time stamp from John? Why, why is that necessary? Well, John provides the detail that he does because he wants you and I, the readers, to be convinced that this was a real historical event, that this was a real historical day in a real historical city with real historical people. John's written testimony is such that the account in our passage today is not just some subjective spiritual experience by three of Jesus' followers. It was a real observable event. And for Mary Magdalene, it involved her engaging with three senses. Senses meaning touch, hear, see. And this is why John uses concrete language to communicate that this account was real. John chapter 20, verse 1 says, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. So who is this Mary Magdalene? 
We know from the descriptor Magdalene that she was from the fishing port, the fishing town on the Sea of Galilee called Magdala. You can see it on the, on the map there where it's circled. There's archaeological evidence of docks and fish sorting tanks in the stone market there. The next slides. Those were the tanks where the fish were sorted. Those were the docks. The Sea of Galilee is off to the left there where it's white. This is a real place. I've been there. I took these pictures. This is an impressive site. It has original mosaics and two synagogues. You know, this town Magdala is within walking distance of the very secular city, Roman city Tiberias. That's just to the south of Magdala. There's some indication that suggests that Magdala was the largest city in Galilee prior to Herod building Tiberias. Magdala is also not far from Capernaum, just to the north, where Peter and John are from. Both of them are in our passage today. We learn from Luke chapter 8, verse 2, that Jesus had delivered Mary Magdalene from seven demons and infirmities. He had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. And there's, a, there's no other record in the Gospels about Mary until we learn in John chapter 19, verse 5, that Mary Magdalene stood with the other Marys near the base of the cross as Jesus was crucified and died. So standing near the cross were Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. It seems clear that after Mary Magdalene's encounter with the freeing presence of Jesus, that Mary Magdalene herself became a devout disciple of Jesus who had delivered her from so much suffering. In the end of verse 1, it says, Mary came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Typically, tombs were cut out of stone into the stone and it required some type of blocker on the outside to cover the entrance to the tomb. Typically, these were solid, round, disc-shaped stone blockers rolled in place covering the entrance. They were, the body was put inside and then they were sealed with plaster until the, the placed bodies would then decompose. Due to the stone's extreme weight, even the smaller stone blockers require many hands to roll them or even animals to pull them but the text tells us that when Mary came to the tomb, she found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Verse 2 tells us that upon this discovery, in verse 2, it says that she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. The text does not tell us that she looked into the tomb at this point. However, it's implied that she did look in based on what she says to Peter and John. And now note here, in this verse, all of the action words associated with Mary Magdalene in the first two verses. In verses one and two, it says she came, she found the tomb empty, she ran, she found Peter and John, and then she said to them, these words add to the picture of who Mary Magdalene is. And it seems from the account so far that she is a deeply devoted, caring person with big feelings, and she's a person of action. Look what she says to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom we interpret to be John, the apostle, the author. Mary says to them, they have taken away the Lord's body from the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, this statement that she made tells us several things. One, that Mary Magdalene was not alone at the tomb. She uses the word we. This is consistent with the other Gospels that include the two other Marys present with her at the tomb. Another unique thing in her statement tells us that, that she uses the word they, and it indicates that Mary assumes that someone did something with Jesus' body meaning they moved it. Possibilities of who the they are could be the gardener, which she proposes later in the story. Another possibility of who the they are are the religious leaders or the Roman authorities who may have had interest in 
removing Jesus' body. Some commentators have also proposed grave robbers who would typically look for valuables, rings, gold teeth, those types of things. What is clearly absent, though, in Mary's statement is any indication that she may have believed that a resurrection happened. I imagine Mary's announcement to Simon Peter and John being really dramatic, a dramatic entrance that's completely unexpected. And the result of Mary's unexpected announcement is that these two disciples start running towards the tomb. In verse 3 and 4, it says Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So more disciples running here. Mary ran to Peter and John, and now the disciples are running to the tomb. To add to that mental picture, the only flat spot in Jerusalem, the only flat spots are on top of the Temple Mount itself and the top of Mount Zion. It's hills in every direction. You can see that on the top of the map, the next slide, with the contour lines there. So they're running up and down hills. Wherever that, wherever that tomb was, they were running. And note, it's dark. Maybe they're running with torches. I don't know. That sounds kind of dangerous to me, like running with scissors. The text doesn't tell us why Mary went to Peter and John. It doesn't tell us where Peter and John were, but obviously she knew. And again, for context, all of this running happens before daybreak. Any of you early morning runners? If you are, it's biblical. (laughs) Verse 4 tells us that the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now we start to have some comparison of characters here in this story. John, the author, offers no further clue as to why he told us he arrived first. It's probably not wise for us to surmise anything spiritual from that statement. It probably just means that John was younger, faster. Maybe his personality was just a tad competitive. I imagine John, the author, in his old age here, reminiscing on his youthful vitality. But verse 5 tells us that John stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. It seemed that John had some restraint that kept him from entering the tomb of his dead master. Maybe his Jewish practices of remaining ceremony clean kept him from going in, especially during this holy holiday of Passover. It's not clear why he showed restraint, but there was certainly some caution, some hesitancy at first. But it says he looked in and saw the linen wrappings. The Greek indicates that he was peeping into the tomb from outside. And even from his cautious vantage point, John could see the empty grave wrappings. F.F. Bruce describes the Greek word, the imagery here, as the wrappings being unoccupied, as if the body suddenly became free of its wrappings and the wrappings stayed in place. The wrappings were just collapsed, empty, unoccupied. And note here John's intentional inclusion of detail. He even tells us the type of cloth, linen, and that is 100% consistent with the burial wrappings that were used at the time period. Then Peter, that's bringing up the rear, he arrives on the scene. The text doesn't tell us how long of a gap there was between John and Peter arriving at the tomb. It just tells us that John arrived first. In verse 6, we see the side of Peter that we've now grown to expect. He blows past cautious John and goes right into the tomb. Some commentators call this impetuous, meaning he's doing it without thinking. I like to think of Peter maybe as just bold, and excitable. It says he arrived and went inside, and he also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. See, we already saw what John saw. John saw the linen wrappings, and now we see through Peter's eyes what Peter saw. John's careful to include in his writings that Peter also saw the linen wrappings as John saw them. That makes Peter 
the official second witness. Having a second witness in the Greco-Roman world is critical in the process of establishing truth by eyewitnesses. John is careful to include both John and Peter's witness for his Greek and Jewish readers because the report of Mary Magdalene, although she herself was an eyewitness, in their day, her report would not be considered with nearly the same weight as Peter and John's witness. Both the Jewish Mishnah and the Roman legal system at the time considered a woman's testimony of little account. John also recorded in verse 7 that Peter saw the folded up face cloth. There's much scholarly work done here on researching and meaning, the meaning of this and why John's inspired gospel includes this detail. It says it, it was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Two proposed meanings were that someone took the time to be neat and folded it up. The Greek here word also means rolled up. And thus perhaps it's lying as it would have been used where it would have been used. How it's used is unclear and debated. Whatever the meaning, most scholars agree that the text supports that the glorified body of Jesus passed through the grave wrappings and the wrappings were found where they lay empty, unoccupied. From the perspective of a witness, the unoccupied grave wrappings, although mute, they themselves are a material witness to the resurrection. Think about how Lazarus came out of the tomb, out of his tomb, fully wrapped, including his face. Contrast that to Jesus. In verse 8, cautious John went into the tomb. John 20, verse 8. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. This appears to be an immediate aha moment Light bulbs fully on, mind blown type of thing. John went in, he saw and believed. So let's track the approach of John to the empty tomb and his journey of becoming to believe, of coming to believe in the resurrection of Jesus that happened on the third day. John hears that the tomb is empty from Mary early in the morning. He runs to the tomb, he peeps cautiously respectfully in from the outside. He sees the unoccupied grave wrappings. Then Peter rushes by him into the tomb. And then John goes into the tomb as well. And it says he saw and believed. Verse 9 fills in a little bit more of the process for John coming to believe. It says, for until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. It seems to imply that when John saw the evidence indicating a resurrection on the third day, that then the Old Testament scriptures pointing to the resurrection started falling into place in his thinking. Now keep in mind that his belief happens even though he has not seen a risen Jesus. But what the text adds here is important. It says in verse 9, for until then... That critical point, they had not understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. The text doesn't tell us what these scriptures were, but let me give you one possible option. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2 says, After two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. That we may live where? In his presence. That sounds like what Jesus said would happen after he returned to the Father, which was after the resurrection. Look at John chapter 14, verse 23. This is Jesus talking about after he ascends. He says, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. In his presence. Back to the text in John chapter 20. Verses 8 and 9, it doesn't include Peter coming to believe in the resurrection of Jesus at this point. Rather, in verse 10, it just tells us that they both left and went home. We know from another gospel account in Luke chapter 24, verse 12, it tells us that Peter left the empty tomb wondering 
What had happened? For Peter, I, I wonder myself how much shame and guilt he was carrying over the three denials. I wonder if that had anything to do with him not believing at the moment. What we also know from Luke's gospel is that later on this same day, the very same day, Jesus appeared specifically to Peter. Look at Luke 23 or 24, 33. This is the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus when they're, on, when they're back, going back to Jerusalem. It says, there they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Of course, the rest of Peter's life Peter's writings, Peter's actions, Peter dying as a martyr, all of that substantiates Peter's belief in a resurrected Jesus. So let's look at Peter's approach to the empty tomb. Initially, Peter coming to believe is very similar to John's process. Peter hears the tomb is empty for Mary early in the morning. He runs to the tomb. He boldly runs right into the tomb, and he sees the unoccupied grave wrappings. We know from Luke's account that Peter leaves wondering what happened. And at some point the same day, Jesus appears to Peter. And then Peter tells the other disciples that Jesus is risen. That's Peter's approach. But let's look again back to Mary's approach to the empty tomb and her journey of belief in the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 11, the story of Mary continues here. It says, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. Now, there's some information here that's not included in the text. The text does not tell us when she returned to the tomb after telling Peter and John that Jesus' body was missing. In verse 11, it just tells us that she's there. In my mind, in my mind only, I imagine her running with Peter and John to the tomb, but the text doesn't say that. And then when John and Peter leave, Mary stays. The text does tell us that Mary was crying. It tells us that she wept. So think a significant outpour of emotions here, of grief. And John records that Mary, like John and Peter, also looked in. She looked in. This involves her sense of sight, one of the three senses that are recorded by John and Mary's experience here. And what she saw was amazing and unique to her. Verse 12 says this. John 20, verse 12. I don't have this verse memorized. There we go. She saw the two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. By the way, any time that there's a technical issue, it's usually my fault not having something marked in the text here. Now, a couple observations here of what she saw that was amazing and unique to her. Note, the angels were not mentioned by Peter and John, so we can assume this angel appearance is unique to just Mary. Mary also noticed that the angels were in white, which, is, which would stand out in contrast to the darkness of the time of day, but also would stand out in contrast to the darkness of Mary's mood. Remember, she's grieving. Mary also reported where the angels were sitting. One at the head, one at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. Some have connected the positioning of the angels where Jesus laid to the positioning of the angels over the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 25, 19 through 20 says, Mold the cherubim, another word for angels, on each end of the atonement cover, making it all of one piece of gold. The cherubim would face each other and look down on their atonement cover. With their wings spread above it, they will protect it. Now, should John 20, verse 12, should that really be an allusion to the cherubim at the Ark of the Covenant? The spiritual meaning of that is unclear to me other than it provides really cool imagery, biblical continuity. In verse 13, the angel speaks to Mary and says, Dear woman, why are you crying? 
I'll just pause for a second there. Mary is at a tomb where there was a recent burial of someone she loved and she's crying. I think that's an expected emotional display for someone that just loves someone that they, someone just lost someone that they loved. So the question here doesn't really make sense unless it indicates that Mary's crying was not congruent with the reality of the moment, meaning her crying was no longer necessary. Why are you crying? The question indicates that something has changed, as if the question itself implies there's no longer any need to cry. And Mary responds to the angel's question in verse 13, because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. Mary's response to the angels is similar to what she reported to Peter and John at the end of verse 2. Except in Mary's response to the angel, she calls Jesus the Lord. Here she says, my Lord. My Lord. The word Lord in the Greek, kurios, it means master as the one who owns you and has the power of decision over your life. When you and I use the word Lord, that's what it means. That he owns us and has the power of decision for us. The word clearly fits her situation as Jesus is the Lord Master who set her free from her other master, Satan, who she was a slave to and controlled by seven demons. And in that context of being set free from a previous evil master, we can understand her deep devotion to Jesus and her sense of deep loss at Jesus' death. The angels don't respond to Mary at all. Rather, in verse 14, it says she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. John notes that she doesn't recognize Jesus. We know that there's at least two things indicating the text that may be preventing her from recognizing Jesus. The first is that Mary assumed that someone had taken away Jesus' body. It's what she told Peter and John. It's what she told the angels. And her answer for the empty tomb seems to be an assumption without consideration of the supernatural. Assumptions can be blinding for you and I. It makes us miss the obvious. The second thing we know that may be preventing her from recognizing Jesus is her grief. Mary may literally be blinded by tears. She can't see through the tears, which is real. But she may also be blinded by grief itself. John records Mary weeping in verse 11. The angels note she's weeping in verse 13. Jesus notes that she's weeping in verse 15. Being blinded by grief is a real thing. Grief can taint and twist and shroud one's perception of reality. Of reality. Grief can hold on to a person and cruelly not let them go, causing them to be negative. Grief can discourage belief. Mary is grieving. But in verse 15, we see that Jesus repeats the same question that the angels asked. Dear woman, why are you crying? Again, the question implies that there's no longer a need to cry, but the truth just hadn't registered yet for Mary. And here Jesus asked her a second different question, who are you looking for? Now this second question is a clue for you and I, the readers, that something totally awesome is about to happen. Where else did we see Jesus ask this very question recently? It's the exact same question that Jesus asked back in John chapter 18, verse 4 and 5, when Judas and the cohort of troops came to arrest Jesus in the garden. Jesus asked them, who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. When Jesus answered, I am he, in the Greek, it's literally, the I am is here, 
That was Jesus saying that he was Yahweh, that he was Jehovah, the great I am. And remember that when he said that, all the troops, including Judas, fell back as he said it. But here in John 20, verse 15, Jesus Jesus uses the same question, who are you looking for? And it may cause the readers to lean in expecting something cool to happen again related to Jesus being Yahweh, being Jehovah, the great I am. But the effect here when Jesus says that, when he asks that question, it's different. Here the voice of Jesus as the I am doesn't cause the hearer to fall back. Rather, Jesus' voice, the voice of the I am, draws the hearer, Mary, to himself. And watch how that happens next. Verse 15 says that Mary thought he was the gardener. So once again, for the third time in the account, Mary asserts her assumption that someone took the body, but this time she ups her commitments that if she knew where his body was, she would go and get him. I love that. Helps us picture who Mary is. From my perspective, Mary Magdalene sounds like a force of nature. She's going to feel what she feels and feel it deeply. She's going to do what she's going to do and believe what she's going to believe until someone changes her thinking. You know anyone like that? Who possibly could change Mary's thinking at this point? Verse 16, Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. This time when Jesus speaks to her, he only speaks one word, her name, Mary. Jesus called her by name and she heard her. John 10, verse 3 and 4 says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to them. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. In John chapter 10, She calls him, sorry, back in John 20, she calls him Rabboni. Rabboni doesn't just mean teacher, it means my teacher. It's in a possessive, honoring sense here. You can almost feel the immediate change in Mary. Her distress vanishes. And Mary doesn't just respond with her voice. The next line in, chapter, in verse 17 says she clung to him. It indicates that she was clinging to him. Jesus says, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. This is a beautiful moment. It's that sudden lifting of heaviness, the instant relief that makes you feel like you're levitating. It's that first deep cleansing breath of restored hope and assurance. My wife and I felt that after each of our son Daniel's surgeries. I imagine here Mary's tears of grief turning to tears of joy. Isn't that what Jesus said would happen in John chapter 16, verse 20? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. Jesus said to her in verse 17, don't cling to me. Given the context of Mary's grief, It's followed by huge relief. Those words seem harsh to you and I, the reader, but what the text does not tell us is how long or how strongly she was literally holding on to Jesus at this point. I think Jesus was, and I might be inserting my own feelings in this, but I think Jesus, after a long moment of Mary clinging to him, said to Mary, Mary, you have to let me go. Sort of like when you and I receive when we are receiving a suffocating hug. Jesus says to her in verse 17, why she has to let him go, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. And this is, this is tougher to discern the meaning, but what I suggest it means is that Jesus is telling Mary a couple of things here. Jesus said 
before that he will be leaving her and the other disciples again. And Jesus is preparing Mary now for another departure. Not by death, not by his death, but rather by his ascension to the Father. And the second thing that Jesus may be telling Mary is that she's going to have to learn a new way to cling to him after he leaves her, his physical presence leaves. See, that's consistent with with what Jesus taught the disciples about abiding in John chapter 15, that Mary will have to learn to cling to Jesus through abiding, through his abiding spirit in her, through his abiding presence in her, through his words in her heart, in her mind. And this new way of clinging to Jesus is better for her and better for all the disciples while we are still in this world. Jesus says in verse 17, but go, John chapter 20, verse 17, but go and tell my brothers John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus is is speaking here of Mary to go and tell, to give a message to the other disciples. But go find my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. This is the first time that Jesus uses the word brothers to describe the disciples. This is the resurrected Jesus in now his eternal glorified body calling the mortal disciples brothers. Well, how are they brothers? Because now through the sacrifice of Jesus, they share an eternal relationship with God the Father. And it clearly implies that Mary is a sister in this eternal family. The prophetic Psalm 22 says this in verse 22. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. And now in verse 18, we see Mary in action again. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I've seen the Lord, and then she gave them his message. The first thing that Mary did was testify to the brothers that she saw a risen Jesus, the Lord. Then she obediently gave them Jesus' message. So let me ask you again, how do you approach the empty tomb? In our account today, we saw Mary, John, and Peter, that they all approached the empty tomb and they looked in. They all saw what they were going to see through their eyes, through their filters. The text tells us cautious John peeped into the tomb from the outside. He saw the linen wrappings. He eventually followed Peter in and he went in. He saw and he believed. John then understood what the empty tomb and grave wrappings meant through the lens of scriptures that he had never understood before. Impetuous Peter boldly ran to the tomb, saw the linen wrappings and the face cloth and left wondering what it meant until Jesus personally appeared to him later that day, ending his wonderings. Mary Magdalene's approach to the empty tomb and her encounter with the resurrected Jesus are the focus of this passage. The text begins in verse 20, verse 1, with Mary Magdalene. In verse 18, it ends with Mary Magdalene. We see her approach presented in comparison and contrast to Peter and John. Mary came to the tomb broken in grief. She found the tomb empty. She assumed the body was taken. She stated at three different times that it was taken to Peter and John, the angels, and then to the person she thought was the gardener. Mary was asked why she was crying twice. And then Mary was asked by Jesus who she was looking for. But then when she heard Jesus call her by name, she recognized the voice. She saw it was Jesus. She believed then. She physically touched him. She clung to the risen Jesus. It's through the witness of Mary that we have the three senses. She saw him. She heard him. She touched him. All three of these disciples had a different approach to seeing the empty tomb, but in the end, they all came to believe that there was a risen Jesus. In Greek culture, three is more than enough to substantiate truth. 
We have three witnesses to the risen Savior. We have three different approaches from three different people telling us that not everyone comes to believe via the same path. If there would have been a fourth person in this text, their approach and pathway would have also been different. We actually see that in the next passage with Thomas. Every person has their own approach to the empty tomb. Every person has their own pathway to to their belief. But in our passage today, all came to believe in the risen Jesus. And it doesn't just stop there with their belief. Each of them testified about that. Mary was the first to testify about the risen Jesus. But what is significant is that Jesus met them where they were. Jesus met John. He met him and reveals the scriptures. Jesus met Peter in his wanderings, and Jesus met Mary Magdalene in her grief. But how do you approach the empty tomb and the claims of the risen Jesus? Cautiously like John, boldly but with wanderings like Peter, through the lens of heavy emotions, through the lens of assumptions like Mary? Does your heart and mind have room for the supernatural? See, because today you have looked into the empty tomb through the eyes of Mary, through the eyes of John, and through the eyes of Peter, and you saw what they saw. My witness to you today And the witness of Mary and Peter and John is that the reason there was an empty tomb is because there is a risen Jesus. Amen? And for those of you that are already followers, testify to that truth. Jesus is risen. Let's pray. Father God, what a glorious day. What a glorious day. The day that you rose from the grave with that we have hope. With that we have salvation. With that we have your spirit within us. May we testify to your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. God sent His Son They called Him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever. Happy Easter. Go in his peace.